Lecture 5.1 Capitalism, Ethical Behavior, and Social Cooperation Up to this point, we've concentrated on production and economic growth in making the case that capitalist institutions are uniquely powerful weapons in the ongoing battle against world poverty. And that case is strong, not just theory and logic, but also data, examples, and anecdotes have provided evidence that markets, secure property rights, and entrepreneurial freedom generate wealth for all levels of society. But for those, and that's probably most of us, who believe that man does not live by bread alone, the question of whether capitalism is good for the poor has more than one dimension. Yes, it's encouraging and vitally important to know that capitalist institutions can raise material standards of living, improve health and longevity, and help to provide adequate food, clothing, and shelter. But it's also pertinent to ask about the non-material dimension of human life. What are we to make of the admonition that the profit motive and competition render capitalist institutions dangerous to developing economies and their impoverished citizens? by encouraging crass materialism and undermining ethical and cooperative behavior. Ironically, it may be that the very wealth produced by capitalism grants us the luxury of caring about such ethical dilemmas. In late 1990, not too long after the fall of the Soviet Union, The Margin magazine published an interview with Sabrina Muller, a mother of two children and an art teacher in the former East Germany. She notes, we were raised in the GDR to think that Westerners are evil capitalist materialists. But the truth is, people in the East are the real materialists. When your shops are always empty, when you have to stand in line for an orange, when you wait ten years for a lousy car, you spend your life obsessed with things. As we start to look at non-material welfare, we're entering into the field of ethics we'll restrict our focus to normative ethics, the standards or rules that guide right or wrong conduct. For simplicity's sake, let's define ethical behavior as that which conforms to generally accepted standards of right conduct. Using that definition, then, we'll structure our inquiry around the capitalist institutions responsible for economic growth. As we reconsider those institutions, we'll be asking whether the incentives they create encourage people to act ethically, or in terms of our definition of ethics, do the incentives of capitalist institutions encourage people to behave in accordance with generally accepted standards of right conduct? Let's start this inquiry as we did with our investigation into economic growth, with property rights and in particular, the right to self. Professor P.J. Hill, a Wheaton College economist and writer, pinpoints the non-material benefits of capitalism's insistence on the right to self. Capitalism advantages the poor because for the first time in history, it takes the dignity and the worth of individuals seriously and gives all people, especially the powerless and dispossessed, a sphere of action that is immune from the control of others. Self-ownership, the property right to self, is fundamental to recognition of human dignity. Modern capitalism is unique in granting this presumption of dignity even to the poorest members of society. It does so by assuming the autonomy of the individual. The norm of history before the rise of capitalist institutions in Europe was that the poor existed at and for the pleasure of the wealthy and powerful. For all practical purposes, they owned nothing not even the fruits of their own efforts. As Professor Hill points out, the historical link between the spread of capitalist institutions and the spread of human rights can be clearly established. Until about the 16th century, slavery, feudal obligation, and conscription shaped the lives of the poorest in European societies. But these institutions weakened as commercial relationships became increasingly important. By 1700, the commercial societies of the English and the Dutch in particular had institutionalized in practice and in law people's right to their own labor. The ethical implications of this change are significant. Self-ownership means that every individual has two alternatives, work for himself or work for someone else. 
Each of these options engenders its own dynamic and its own set of ethical implications. Suppose a person decides to work for someone else. A common choice as commerce and the practice of voluntary exchange spread throughout Europe. As the demand for labor increased, employers found that they must reward workers for their efforts in order to keep them. While this has obvious material consequences, it also has ethical consequences in the tacit acknowledgement of the humanity of the worker. Suppose, on the other hand, an individual decides to work for himself. Ben Franklin, speaking as poor Richard, reminded us that the market rewards diligence, initiative, and hard work, and punishes laziness. And perhaps most importantly from an ethical perspective, it makes the individual responsible for his own well-being. Self-ownership has ethical implications not only for the treatment of the poor by others, but also for their own conduct. In effect, self-ownership grants the power to choose, and with that power comes responsibility for the consequences of choices. Capitalism based on private ownership of self and property is unique among economic systems in fully recognizing the importance of choice. The fundamental principle of voluntary exchange is an outgrowth of a belief that individuals are capable of choosing their own conduct and that to prevent them from doing so is ethically untenable. The study of ethics asserts that choice is necessary for concepts of right and wrong to have meaning. Ethical judgments are possible only in situations where individuals can initiate actions and are responsible for the consequences of those actions. Logically, then, the condition of the poor historically and in much of the developing world today is deplorable not only in the material sense, but also in the ethical sense. Without self-ownership, the decisions made by poor individuals are constrained, and others control the alternatives they face, meaning that ethically they can be assigned virtually no responsibility for the economic condition of their lives. More importantly, their ethical impairment is long-lived, they have neither the incentive nor the ability to make choices that enhance theirs or their children's long-term dignity and well-being. Possessed of self-ownership and the right to choose, however, the individual is ethically burdened by a measure of responsibility for his own well-being. Happily, as we saw in the earlier lessons, the incentives associated with property rights help him discharge this responsibility. Profits an extremely strong incentive, rewarding hard work and punishing laziness, and encouraging diligence, initiative, careful husbandry, and investment. The second institution we identified as contributing to the material well-being of the poor was open competitive markets. Ironically, competition and competitive markets are the capitalist institutions most often associated with greed and most often chastised by critics as corrupting. The criticism suggests that the poor in developing nations live in a sort of virtuous poverty based on cooperation and are admirably selfless in their deprivation. Now, modern floods of immigrants trying to get into market-oriented economies raise the question of whether the virtuous poor are really happy to be so virtuous, but it's not a new question. The line of thinking asserts that while capitalism may help people improve their standard of living, it does so by encouraging them to be selfish and thus robs them of their better nature. Proponents of this argument point for affirmation to Adam Smith's depiction of the self-interested man. A more thorough reading of Smith, including his writings on man's moral sentiments, leads us to a different direction, however. Indeed, Smith argues that capitalist institutions do not encourage selfishness, but instead require socially cooperative ethical behavior based on studied attention to the needs and wants of others, and that man's propensity to judge his own actions as he judges others reinforces this behavior. Adam Smith based his belief in the power of markets to promote ethical interactions on his assessment of the importance of reputation in the ongoing process of exchange. He notes, A dealer is afraid of losing his character and is scrupulous in observing every engagement. When a person makes perhaps 20 contracts in a day, he cannot gain so much by endeavoring to impose on his neighbors as the very appearance of a cheat would make him lose. In simple terms, 
He's saying that the gains from cheating one person cannot begin to outweigh the business loss to a reputation for dishonesty. In economies that depend on impersonal, often faceless transactions, a reputation for honesty and trustworthiness is essential to success. And, Smith believed, the more people engaged in commerce, the more powerfully this lesson in market feedback was impressed upon them and influenced their behaviors, even to the point where those behaviors became known as national characteristics. Whenever commerce is introduced into any country, probity and punctuality always accompany it. These virtues in a rude and barbarous country are almost unknown. Of all the nations in Europe, the Dutch, the most commercial, are the most faithful to their word. This is not to be imputed to national character, as some pretend. There's no natural reason why a Scotsman should not be as punctual in performing agreements as a Dutchman. It's important to note that Smith is not talking here about virtue. He's not commenting on whether or not participants in markets are good people. He's talking about ethics, the way people behave. And he's asserting that the incentives in markets encourage the very behaviors valued by civil society. History and contemporary research both echo Smith's conclusions that entrepreneurs' awareness of the importance of their reputation encourages ethical behavior. During the Middle Ages, merchants adopted commercial codes of conduct. And we see similar activity today in associations like the Better Business Bureau and Chambers of Commerce. While cynics point to business scandals and assert that the threat and example of lengthy jail sentences is responsible for whatever integrity exists in competitive business, recent research suggests that good conduct is routinely sustained in markets even in the absence of government oversight and threat of punishment. Common sense reminds us that bad news makes headlines, while the day-to-day -day ethical conduct of business is overlooked as routine. Researchers point out that such widespread practices as the use of brand names and encouragement of repeat business through special pricing both attest to sellers' awareness that their reputation for honesty and fair dealing is rewarded in the market. Similarly, we can point to the ability of competitive markets to punish unethical behavior that threatens the market's viability. Legal punishments for unethical behavior tend to garner a great deal of media attention Indeed, it would have been difficult to not be aware of the Enron scandal anywhere on Earth. Less attention, however, is paid to instances in which the market itself, independent of legal sanctions, punishes unethical behavior. And yet, it's an important dynamic that we should be aware of. Two recent examples illustrate the point. The prestigious accounting firm Arthur Anderson failed virtually overnight in the wake of the Enron scandal. Customers didn't wait for criminal investigations or accusations of wrongdoing, but fled upon the discovery of the firm's apparent indifference to accepted standards of integrity. Other accounting companies, quickly reading the expectations of consumers and society, adjusted their reporting and accountability standards beyond even those required by law as they competed for clients. The second example, a study of consumer response to airline crashes, also shows that the market punishes companies that behave unethically. A study of consumer and stockholder response to airline crashes over a 20-year period in the late 20th century showed that the market clearly distinguished between truly accidental crashes and those caused by carrier negligence. Quote, In those instances where there is the greatest likelihood that the air carrier is at fault, there is a significantly negative stock market reaction to the event. However, in cases where there is less reason to suspect that the airline shirked its safety responsibilities, there is no adverse stock performance. Our results suggest the market is quite efficient in punishing airlines for at-fault crashes. The mechanism that polices market behavior is, of course, competition. Is competition a good thing? Critics of market capitalism say it's harmful, that it encourages greed and creates divisiveness in society. Critics of competitive markets often contrast the competition that is essential to such markets with non-competitive cooperation. They believe that competition goes along with such characteristics as aggression, emulation, rivalry, conflict, and strife, and that cooperation belongs with mutual aid, 
benevolence, modesty, and harmony. In their view, it follows that economic competition is morally inferior to cooperation, to non-competitive modes of commercial and industrial organization. Defenders reply that competition isn't good or bad in itself, it just is. Lord Hugh Acton, 20th century scholar and political philosopher, dispatches the notion that we could just abolish competition and decide to cooperate. Proceeding from the dictionary definition of competition as the action of endeavoring to gain what another endeavors to gain at the same time, he reminds us that because scarcity exists, we can't escape competition. We are inevitably in a situation of trying to gain what others are trying to gain. Banishing competition is not an option. Accepting that reality helps us to zero in on a more important question. What form should competition take? What form is best for society? The economist would answer that market competition, in addition to its role in creating material wealth, is an ethically sound form of competition because it is not rivalrous. The distinction between competition and rivalry that we made in an earlier lecture is also ethically instructive. The key distinction is one of intent. The essence of competition is that each competitor strives after what he wants. The essence of rivalry is that each competitor strives to outdo the others. In competition, the failure of the losers is a consequence of the success of the winners, not something that the winners aim to secure. Rivals, on the other hand, set out to defeat each other as well as to win the prize. Further, market competition is ethical in that it does not oppose or undermine social cooperation. In fact, as Lord Acton again points out, undirected cooperation is nonetheless cooperation, and markets run on undirected cooperation. People may cooperate without deliberately setting out to do so. This indeed is what generally happens when commodities are produced under competitive market conditions. In his Harmonies Economique, Bastiat wrote of the mining, smelting, manufacturing, transporting, financing, and storing involved in producing a cheap lamp for sale to a French workman. Firms and individuals all over the world had worked together in producing it, but no one man or body of men had organized all these processes so as to fit them together into a whole. The mine owner, the miner, the metal worker, the carrier, each pursued his own ends and without even considering the lamps that resulted, cooperated in producing them and getting them to the shops and to the purchaser. Competitive cooperation, therefore, is not a contradiction in terms. Competition is not opposed to cooperation. We might reasonably ask whether there is empirical evidence for the assertion that competition and cooperation are not mutually exclusive, and there certainly is. Capitalist societies, including the United States, have long exhibited attention to social concerns through voluntary association and charitable activity. Writing in the 1830s, Alexis de Tocqueville commented at length on Americans' highly developed social instincts, if not the result of their commercial competition, then at least certainly not inhibited by it. He comments in Democracy in America. Americans have not only commercial and industrial associations in which all take part, but others of a thousand different types, religious, moral, serious, feudal, very general and very limited, immensely large and very minute. Americans combine to give fetes, found seminaries, build churches, distribute books, and send missionaries to the Antipodes. Hospitals, prisons, and schools take shape in that way. The devotion to mutual aid that de Tocqueville noted in the early 19th century wasn't serendipitous, and it didn't disappear as capitalism transformed the United States into an economic powerhouse. Research shows that one-third of the American adult male population held membership in fraternal societies in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These societies gave assistance in case of job loss, injury, or illness, and some even provided families with death benefits. This pattern of social cooperation and mutual aid was replicated in other competitive market economies. Great Britain and Australia both had so-called friendly societies, which were the major providers of social welfare during this time period. And what about today? According to the Giving USA Foundation and the Center for Philanthropy at Indiana University, 
Charitable donations in 2004 amounted to $248.52 billion, the bulk from individuals. Their website says, Charitable giving is the lifeblood of more than a million American nonprofits, says Henry Goldstein, chair of the Giving USA Foundation. Contributions fund research in medicine and the social sciences, endow scholarships, support museums and orchestras, and so much more. Giving USA reports giving from four sources of contributions individual living donors, bequests by deceased individuals, foundations, and corporations. All four sources of giving are estimated to have increased their contributions in 2004 by 4 to 9 percent. Individual giving, the single largest source, rose by an estimated 4.1 percent in 2004 to reach $187.92 billion. Living individuals account for three quarters of total charitable giving in the United States and have done so since Giving USA began publication. About 70 to 80 percent of Americans contribute annually to at least one charity. It probably goes without saying that the social concern evidenced by charitable activity in many developed nations can't be credited solely to the market. As numerous economists and philosophers, including Adam Smith, have pointed out, civil societies require more than effective economic systems. They also require moral cultural systems that hold people accountable and give meaning to human relationships beyond the market. That being the case, however, it's also clear that the habits and patterns of interaction in competitive markets need not undermine and may, in fact, provide strong incentives for ethical social conduct. Moving from markets to entrepreneurship, the third capitalist institution we identified as a source of economic growth, we find that capitalism provides strong incentives not only for social cooperation and behavior, but also for admirable personal conduct. Rather than undermining ethical conduct, entrepreneurship rewards and reinforces many admirable behavior traits. By providing incentives for individuals to become entrepreneurs, Capitalist institutions encourage diligence, initiative, and hard work. By making a reputation for trustworthiness a requirement for ongoing success, markets promote honesty and responsibility. By generating rewards for savings, markets encourage careful stewardship and discourage improvidence among entrepreneurs. The economic historian Deirdre McCloskey has identified a set of bourgeois values Values that came to characterize the commercial class that grew as capitalist institutions developed and flourished. In the paired samples below, note the differences from aristocratic values that they replaced and their similarity to the values we associate with the best of civil society today. The power of reputation, favorable or unfavorable, is a lesson taught over and over again to entrepreneurs by the market. We see its effects in the trend toward the adoption by business of codes of conduct. While we tend to be most aware of such codes when their violation becomes scandal headlines, it's instructive to note their growing presence. The market and consumers demand them and business responds. We also might consider the possibility that the fact that we are little aware of codes of conduct may be testimony to their effectiveness. And there are some illustrative anecdotes. Perhaps most sensational was the 1982 product tampering in Chicago drug stores that led to cyanide poisoning deaths of seven Tylenol users. Economist Michael Novak tells the story of Johnson & Johnson's response to the Tylenol tampering. Virtually without hesitation, top executives at J&J &J immediately ordered the withdrawal of all Tylenol capsules for the entire U.S. market although all the deaths occurred only in the Chicago area. They also assigned 2,500 personnel to an all-out communication effort to alert the public to this problem to prevent any further incidents. The cost of removing the product amounted to $100 million. The Washington Post wrote of the crisis that, quote, Johnson & Johnson has succeeded in portraying itself to the public as a company willing to do what's right regardless of cost. But J&J &J not only portrayed itself that way, that's the way it acted. 
it was in no position to dictate the portrayal the media would give to its actions. It simply did the right thing and let the chips fall. One hundred million dollars worth. Novak goes on to explain that Johnson & Johnson executives were aided in their quick decision making by the existence of their company's code of conduct, or credo, and their history of abiding by that credo. You can look at it in the next few slides. To recap then, there is significant logical and empirical support for the position that the incentives associated with capitalist institutions are compatible with the goals of civil society in that they reward such traditionally admired virtues as honesty, integrity, diligence, and responsibility, and that they require attention to the needs and wants of others. I have to emphasize here that the claim is not that capitalist incentives make people morally good only that the incentives encourage them to act, to behave, in an ethical manner in their public commercial lives. Michael Novak again. Markets require that even those persons who are not particularly other regarding in their personal lives become so in their market behavior. Since market exchanges are voluntary, and since the objects the purchaser might acquire are many, entry into the market obliges sellers to become to an important degree other regarding. We'd be remiss to end this discussion without acknowledging the scholarly concerns about the impact of capitalist institutions on ethics in places without the appropriate supporting social and cultural institutions, a situation in which many of the world's poor exist. While capitalist institutions are unsurpassed in increasing standards of living and are well suited for ordering the economic functions of society, they are not in and of themselves sufficient for other important components of human flourishing. The dangers to civil society from capitalist economic institutions that are most commonly noted by scholars include the potential for radical individualism and the divisiveness that can be caused by income inequality. If market-generated wealth allows people to see themselves as autonomous, the potential exists for weakening of the ethical and social bonds of community. Radical individualism, if unchecked, can increase hedonistic behavior eroding the self-governing behavior that's essential to a civil society, and can turn our attention away from the institutions like family, faith, and community that have been the traditional purveyors of our moral culture. While this threat is not unique to capitalist societies, it nonetheless bears attention. The other oft-noted concern among observers is that while capitalist economies churn out wealth at an unprecedented pace, they don't guarantee an equal distribution of that wealth. And recently, some research has begun to focus on perceptions of wealth, on the importance people attach to their relative well-being. While it's tempting to argue that what should be important is the increase in absolute wealth, research is telling us that the perception of being relatively worse off may overpower the reality of absolute well-being. This potential source of dissatisfaction can be extremely destructive to civil society and cannot be lightly dismissed. On the other hand, however, history has yet to reveal a viable alternative to capitalism. The communist and other types of command economies of the 20th century that institutionalized income equality succeeded only in making sure that the masses were equally poor. Thus, while we must be alert to the discontents of capitalism, we can look to the persistence and vibrancy of the modern developed nations of the world, nations built upon capitalist economic institutions, 
and know that they can successfully combat the discontents and moral temptations that may accompany the benefits of sustained economic growth. Before closing this lecture, I want to provide a short introduction to the activity accompanying the unit. It's called the Ultimatum Game, and it offers teachers a chance to explore issues of capitalism and ethics with their students and introduce them to some of the cutting-edge work that is going on in economic research. One of the things that makes it difficult to argue convincingly that capitalist institutions promote ethical and cooperative behavior is that people tend to regard social sciences like economics as not really science. Political and media debates over economic policy lend credence to the view that all economics is just a matter of opinion, a view that students are far too willing to adopt in classroom discussion. It's not uncommon to find that they dutifully learn what their textbooks tell them without believing that economic reasoning actually works in the real world. The problem's made worse by the traditional approach to social science inquiry, which relies on observation rather than experimentation. However, recent work in an experimental branch of economics has begun to address this problem. And interestingly, some of the findings are directly relevant to the question we started with. Is capitalism good for the poor if good includes more than their material well-being? We encourage you to look at the teacher background materials to the Ultimatum Game Activity so that you'll be armed with scientific data as you broach the topic of the ethics of capitalism with your students.